Welcome to the Center Mid Philosopher. This episode is brought to you by Augustus Royale Fashion. Life's not black and white, it's gray, and gray is beautiful. Check out the brand below in the link. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's episode of the Center Mid Philosopher. Have a an extremely special guest on uh, Logan Paws, um, best teammate I've ever had in my life. Uh, was a real, real, real honor to play alongside him. Um, you know, he was on the the, the full national team when we were teenagers. We played uh, Carolina United together for Elmar Bolowich. Also, want to give a shout out to. Matt Crawford, Michael Gell, Ryan Levitan, uh, Justin Levi, Philip, list goes on and on and on. Um, so many great players on that team, and it was just a, a real pleasure to play alongside Logan. Um, you know, national championship winner at UNC Chapel Hill, 12 year absolute legend at the Chicago Fire, uh, captain, team MVP, um, list goes on and on and on. Um, but just, you know, personally, I'll just a quick introduction is, you know, I've played with some really, really great players, but Logan is uh, up there at the top. You know, your level of professionalism, even when we were kids, was uh, unprecedented and um, was just a joy to play alongside you. You were a leader then. You've always been a leader. Um, it's funny, uh, you got your hair high and tight, but I always remember you with the bushy, curly hair. <laughs> Uh, ripping it behind back of the net, and, you know, you went on to become kind of that traditional number six, a defensive center mid. But I always remember you as the lethal striker that you were. Whenever we needed to go, you got one for us. Um, so Logan, thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure to be here, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that kind, uh, humbling introduction. I appreciate that. Oh man, well, you know. <clears throat> by the way, in researching the world of Logan Paws. I came upon the term underrated a couple of times that literally made me irate because underrated you were not uh, in the state of North Carolina when we were coming along. You were the guy, and we all knew it, and um, you were a heartbreaker and a leader. So to us, you were the hero, and, um, you know, but you went on to become a, a real leader and a, and a legend in the Chicago Fire organization. Um, but let's talk about it, just a couple of things in the world of soccer right now. <laughs> you know, how can you not? There's somebody by the name of Leo Messi, I think, that just signed with Inter Miami. Um, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being most exciting news you've heard in MLS, one being none, where, where would you say your excitement level is on that? Yeah, I mean, this is a 10. <clears throat> I mean, this is, I mean, this is just uh, amazing, amazing for the league, um, for where the league is, you know, uh, wrapping up, you know, Qatar uh, 2022, turning and looking at uh, 26 and what the World Cup means on, on home soil and having a player of messy stature uh, in this country playing domestically in MLS, I think is fantastic. Yeah, I mean it's it's huge. Uh, I, can't, I mean it's just as big as it can get, and you're already seeing the messy effect with you know Instagram followers jumping up into the three four million in 24 hours and ticket sales, and it's really just huge for everyone. And I think the league's got the infrastructure now with the soccer stadiums and the great academy systems and. We're getting an influx of talent from all over the world at young ages. I, I wonder if what will happen is, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is you're starting to see names like Busquets and Di Maria and uh, Suarez. Even though I know Suarez is a little long in the tooth, but he can still ball of maybe joining him. I, I think that would be what makes me the most excited. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, with a player like Messi and Busquets and these, you know, the the league MLS is still looking to crack that media deal, that big time media uh, sponsorship that you see in other professional sports here domestically and then also globally. And so, you know, they've got this really creative, innovative partnership with Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think um, that partnership 
coupled with with Messi, I'm sure they'll do some really cool things moving forward. Yeah, yeah, it could it could be massive. Um, and I'm also interested too, because like, so you were you were there during the Beckham years. Um, <laughs> what was that like? I mean, was that how was the how how were the how was the morale with players around the league when that happened? You know, because I, I I always hate a little bit that in, in you know you were you and Eddie and all these guys were. Um, and Hesmer were kind of pioneers of the league, and you had these massive w- income in, in disparities. And were people generally really excited, or were some people being like, you know, it's great, this I could use a ten thousand dollar raise? I mean, how's the sentiment when Beckham was coming along? Yeah, I mean, I I, I can't speak for everybody, but um, as a competitor, it was it was awesome, right? I mean, you're at that stage, you're just kind of trying to rub two nickels together, uh, (laughs) not really even worried about, um, a contract. You're just grateful to play for a living, to be honest with you, or at least that's how I felt. And so, you know, the league had tried, uh, you know, to some level of success brought foreign players into the league. Um, you know, early on, they were, you know, you would, you would argue that they were past their prime, bringing guys on the downslope of their career. Uh, and the and the amazing thing about uh, about David, about Beckham was uh, he was in the prime. Yeah, he was in the prime of his career, and so coming over here, and you know, as a competitor, you want to go against the best. And you know, the 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 unique thing about Beckham is he came, he competed. And he won. Yep. He won a lot while he was here. Yeah. Um, and so he didn't. He didn't look to collect a paycheck. He knew, uh, you know, he was getting paid well. Uh, but he also knew the responsibility he had. Uh, you know, he shouldered a lot for the growth of our league. You know, I mean, when you look at where the team, the league was when he came in and where it's now, it's largely due to uh, to Beckham. Yeah, and it, it would. It- there's all this stuff on Instagram and stuff now about how, you know, the Beckham effect in a way is still going because would we have gotten messy without Beckham? No, probably. And then he yeah. turned that $25 million inner Miami into a billion dollar club now. And I know with Messi, there's some potential ownership structures in, in there. And I know he's getting the Apple percentage of the Apple deal and the spot in Jersey sales, but who knows what he could end up doing with a team maybe down the road. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I would assume that part of his deal uh, has an ownership clause in it, you know, for a, a reduced fee, expansion fee, whether that's to buy in at Miami, whether that's the next market that they look into that he's got first rider refusal. But, uh, you know, to get a player like Messi, you, you got to get creative. You know, it's oh, yeah. not just to, it's not just about the dollars for him. Uh, and so I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, the league has been creative in the past and I'm sure they're going to do the same, uh, with, with this deal with Messi. That's awesome. Um, you know, actually, you know, touching on, so I'm interested in your thoughts as a, as a former player, you know, with more teams, wh- what are your thoughts on all the expansion? I mean, I, I love it, but I was talking to Eddie, I didn't get the impression he loved it as much because it, he felt like the, it's starting to water the talent down a little bit. What are your thoughts on the never ending expansion? Yeah, I mean, it, um, it's a good question. You know, I mean, there's there's a couple of different levers that need to be kind of thought of and pulled when you think about expansion. If you're if you're only if your doors if it's not an open market and the doors are closed and you're expanding, then you're relying on your domestic talent um, and you know the, the talent that's in the country. Now, if 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 you expand while also continuing to be creative of salary cap and how teams can spend money um, and where they spend money, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're seeing more talent come into the league in their prime. Yep. You know, I also think you see the MLS executives um, kind of understand that they can be a selling league Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay. You know, for some time, a lot of their time was spent on being buyers and, and 
uh, but now thinking about selling players, I think it now creates a, a, a unique opportunity for young domestic players, young foreign players to come in, spend a couple of years in MLS. And, you know, you've seen uh, Almiron come into Atlanta and, you know, now he's, he's an crushing. everyday now he's an everyday starter for Newcastle. And so yeah, he's been great. Those are great stories for the league. So I wouldn't, you know, again, I'm far enough removed that I'm not on the field anymore. I can't really, I'm not there every day, but from my eye, I would, I would argue the other way that I think the talent um, that they're expanding in parallel uh, with the, 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 where the talent is. No, yeah, that's good. I'm, that's, I'm glad to hear that perspective. I mean, you know, here's the other one, the favorite. Uh, not that you're going to answer this one, but um, promotion relegation. Are we ever going to get there with the MLS, do you think? I, you know, I think it's impossible. I mean, I think, uh, I think when you look at a $500 million expansion fee, yeah. there's no way that you can sell a group of investors to say – there's a chance you could spend five hundred million dollars, and in a, the ne- within the next year, that that investment is is like pennies to the dollar, right, yeah. or even less. Um, I just don't, I just don't think that the that it's possible that 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 it's possible, and and you know maybe when you think long, like maybe when I'm long gone, next generation, <laughs> yeah. 20, 30, 40 years from now, that that there's an, a different infrastructure, but when you're trying to expand and you're selling franchises for half a billion dollars, I, I just don't think, I, I don't think you can do it. Would you, would you like to see it? I mean, do you think it would be cool? Uh, I love, I, I love what I, yeah, I love, you know, promotion relegation and what, 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 what it does for the sport and competition and, you know, the, you know, the David versus Goliath. And, you know, when you see these teams that start in, you know, the national league in England and all of a sudden they're like, you know, or the fifth league. Yeah. And now they're going to the, to the prem. I think that's an incredible story, um, which is amazing. So I, I love it in our country with the infrastructure with the league being a single entity the the age of our the league of mls i think it's tough i think it's tough yeah i know it'd be like it'd just be so cool if like el paso locomotive or albuquerque or ford madison or something somehow ended up in the you know that'd be so cool and i mean in cfc or something you know it would be really really cool um but no i totally hear you it's it's hard to um you know, it's hard to see that happening anytime soon. Like you said, maybe when we're we and then just imagine, Matt, that within a couple of years, let's just say both New York teams. You know, I, I, I could argue Chicago because of the size of the media market. Although the you know the my fire been struggling as of late. Yeah. Uh, but let's say both New York teams, Chicago, and both LA teams, the the biggest media markets go down yeah within the within the span of 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 three or four years when when the media is actually something that they're chasing i i I think that a move like that could bury the league uh yeah you know if, if if you had your top teams somehow get relegated you know those those sorts of moves I, I think could bury the, the the professional game in our country, which I would hate to see. Yeah, that would that would be terrible. And that's that's yeah. such a good perspective. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so I want to hear um, some some stories from you about the the good old days in Chicago. You know, I was just again researching the world of of Logan Pauls, and I used to watch you all the time, especially early days. You had <laughs> yes. You're Sorry, good. guys. You're good. You had such a sick team. Um, and I know I'm meshing together teams and eras, but like, yeah. just look yeah. Jim Curtin, Chris Armas, Demarcus Beasley, Damani Ralph, Carlos Bocanegra, Jesse Marsh, Justin Mapp, Chris Rolfe, Tony Santa, Chad Barrett, Zach Thornton, Ante Razov, Brian McBride. I mean, holy Lord. Is that a, 
wrecking crew of some of the best players that's ever played in the MLS. Um, I, so I'm curious, and there, again, I know I'm combine, combining different eras here, but I'm curious, like, in the locker room, who was the alpha in that group? And it could have been you, frankly. But I'm just curious, like, those are some, those are some of the biggest personalities to this very day in, in coaching in the world. Like, yeah. who, who, who was the alpha? Like, who, was, who were the real leaders in that group? Yeah, it's a you know really good question, and and you know it's and some names that that you know Lubush Kubik and Peter Novak, um, you know uh, it got C.J. Brown. I mean, there there were some players. The infrastructure and the culture was built before I got there, mm-hmm. and so it's important to kind of highlight that when I was when I came into Chicago in two thousand and three. Um, the, you know, they had already, they won the double in 98. They had won an open cup in 2000 and real strong infrastructure was already there. So you come into a locker room that's strong mm-hmm. personalities, leadership, you know, when you look at the alphas, <laughs> you know, um, it, it'd be an interesting survey to actually ask others who the alpha and maybe you'd go around the room and everyone would kind of say themselves, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. guys, guys that, that I, um, you know, Jesse Marsh, strong personality, um, both, uh, how he trained, how he played, how he led, he was vocal, uh, Ante Razov, really strong personality. Um, you know, all of these guys were just winners. Uh, and, and, and how they, how they, how they were. And, and so, um, you know, I felt like my job was to come in and put my head down and keep my mouth shut. Um, you know, there's, there's, there are different ways to lead. Um, and I, I felt like leading by example, I had great examples, you know, uh, I couldn't have had a better mentor than Chris Armas. Yep. I mean, if, you know, uh, he just missed my my best eleven uh, in terms of I'd love to put him in there just in terms of the guy that he is the player that he was, um, uh, but you know he was not a, a real he was an alpha but not your traditional um, yelling screaming type of alpha mm-hmm. that you think um, you know Zach Thornton. CJ Brown. I mean, all of these guys had just amazing personality, amazing character, and a real edge about them and a drive to win. Yeah, I mean, God, and the, your answer, if you surveyed everyone, they might all say themselves. <laughs> I love that answer because that's kind of what I was going towards is I'm like, good Lord, you've got Jim Curtin, Chris Armas, Jesse Marsh, um, I mean, those are yeah. like those are some of the biggest coaches in the game right now. Yeah. And um, you know, I love the answer of Ante Razov because that's I, he was sick. I loved watching him. You know who else I thought was nasty was Damani Ralph. Yeah. Um, he was so good. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I again, listeners and viewers, I want to just say uh, it was you too, my friend Logan Pauls. Um, you know, not on in two thousand three. But by 2008, 9, 10, you were the leader and the captain. So I think it's just really cool. And I did read somewhere that you kind of cited Chris Armas as, as probably your most impactful mentor along the way. Um, and uh, I think that's really cool. Like, I'm just curious, like, what were some things you learned from him that you were like, that's how I need to be a leader? Yeah, I mean, those are, those are good questions. I mean, it's tough. Um, you know, you learn, you learn a little something from everybody, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and, you know, for like, for, for like bring, coming back and talking about Ante, mm-hmm. you just learn, he just was a killer. Mm-hmm. He just in big moments in big games, he was a killer. He was a guy you could count on. Mm-hmm. And so you just watch that and observe it. And again, um, I'm a pretty simple minded guy. And so I, I, um, I, I 
from a very early age, never thought that it, there was this really secret recipe. Uh, I, I just watched guys that were better than me and then try to do what they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it's really like that simple of mm -hmm. how I try to think about it of he's on the field, he's playing every game, he plays for the national team. What does he do? Mm -hmm. What and then and then how do I replicate that? You know, that um, what Chris for someone like Chris, his attention to detail, Matt, was incredible. Uh, he did not take one play off. Mm -hmm. uh, he tr every day at training, he competed. I rarely saw people, uh, if any, that could just show up when the lights turn on on Saturday and perform mm -hmm. without really putting in the work mm -hmm. in, in the middle of the week. Right. Um, and, you know, it's one of the things I tell our youth often is you got to work. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to put the work in if you want to be good. Mm -hmm. uh, so att an attention to detail, uh, uh, a, a relentless pursuit to win mm -hmm. and compete. You know, I mean, uh, when you think about the level uh, of, of being at Chapel Hill to then being in the professional game, it just was a different level of competition and edge and detail uh, you know the margins became smaller uh, became more important yeah i mean coming from you that's like mind-blowing too because uh, a desire to win you're up there and and in terms of anyone i've ever met so for you to mention people that had even a stronger drive that's like almost incomprehensible um and you know i mean like jim Curtin, jesse marsh did you see like can you look back and see traits like yeah i can exactly see how those guys have become such big time coaches now yeah yeah you know and they're really different coaches they really have different styles they were different types of players mm -hmm. you know they, they were really good friends mm -hmm. as well so they they learned from each other but jim uh jimmy was really soft-spoken mm -hmm. on the field um and <clears throat> was um you know, a guy, a guy that, you know, played at Villanova, like just grinded his way in mm -hmm. and was a, was a really uh, exceptional player, but knew that he had, a, a, you know, that uh, there was a physical ability, there was a technical ability, but then he knew that his mental and tactical side had to be s far superior than the gifts he was given. Um, and so I think you see that as, as him as a, as a manager now, um, being, uh, having taken that as a player, he was a really cerebral player, uh, thoughtful player, um, into management. He's, he was a soft-spoken, uh, player as well. I, you know, I haven't been in the locker with him, locker room with him as a coach, but I would assume that he really empowers and, um, gives ownership to his team and is soft-spoken, uh, you, you know. It's not that he didn't yell, but when he did, it 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 really mattered. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesse, on the other hand, you know, all of the clips that you see that you saw of him at Leeds, yeah. you know, sliding down the field mm -hmm. on his knees. That's just how he was every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, passionate, uh, competitive, always talking. Sometimes in an, uh, uh, it was annoying, uh, but usually that's just because he was winning and the other team was losing. And so he was running his mouth. Mm -hmm. um, but you see that and how he sees the game and how he coaches the game. Yeah. And I mean, I, I hate to even ask you this question because good Lord, are you close to it with Burhalter? You probably know Burhalter fairly well, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, Jesse, of course, uh, for whatever it's worth, I just want to pre Burhalter. I thought did a phenomenal job. Loved he him did. as a player thought we played really well in the World Cup. I, I, th I think he did a phenomenal job. And I frankly, I'm torn. I mean, maybe we give the baton back to him. But I also am pretty excited about Jesse Marsh. And again, you're, <laughs> you're talking very good friends. Um, I, I, I won't even make you answer that question. But I guess I will just say, are you excited about them both as a potential front runner for the job? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would maybe answer it in reverse. I, I think I, I think they're both brilliant coaches. Yeah. I, I mean, and 
uh, and I think, I mean, we've seen with Greg that he's already done a really good job. Yep. You know, we would have to imagine how Jesse would do, mm-hmm. you know, we don't, we don't have the, the, the data, uh, to, to support that, but I, I, phenomenal coaches that understand both the domestic game and the global game, which I think is a, a unique skill set and an important skill set. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I also believe, you know, there, there are, there, there is value in cycles. I'm not suggesting yeah. that, that Greg only should have one cycle, but when you see coaches, most coaches in their national team don't go beyond two cycles. Rarely do you see it, but just a new voice, a new perspective, new ideas mm-hmm. is, is healthy. So to answer it, I think both, I, I would be supportive of, of both of those guys. Uh, Me too. But knowing that different perspective over time is beneficial. Yeah, it's so funny you mentioned that because we were just talking to Rob Lovejoy, and he actually said maybe there's a value in continuity. That was he wasn't saying that's my vote. He just and you're saying maybe there. And I, I'm with you. There aren't a lot of national team coaches anywhere that coach multiple World Cups. I mean, I don't. Frankly, I can't remember many of those at all. Well, Joachim Lowe in Germany would probably be, but you know, um, there's just not a ton of those. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think Marsh has been great, but again, I love Burhalter. And this is the last thing I'll ask of you, like how, are, how would those two be different? You've already touched on that. Marsh would be a lot more vocal, maybe a lot more demonstrative. How's Burhalter different than Marsh? Um, you know, I, I, um, I think there's an element you know, regarding a man man management, I, I know I can probably speak more on Jesse's side because sure. I know him. Be- I know him better. But both understand the importance of the human behind the player, mm-hmm. and and how you motivate and how you get the. Mo- I mean, really, how you get the most out of um, a, a player. I think. Um, it took some time for Greg to understand that coaching a national team is different than the club team. Mm -hmm. Just the time with the players, the the ideas that you're trying to implement, like you're not on the field every day, right? You once a quarter get four days or two weeks or some finite amount of time to implement ideas. And so, you know, I think Jesse having been Bob Bradley's assistant, through a World Cup cycle prior, b- will bring already what it means in, uh, in the understanding of, of coaching um, a national team. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think similar ideas of the game, both very tactical, uh, 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 tactically smart, innovative. Um, you know, I think Jesse would probably be more well known for his counter pressing. Mm-hmm. And you know the the Red Bull way, sure. which is high pace counter pressing, um, and you saw that with with Greg doing a lot of high press, uh, high high pressing throughout throughout the the games and throughout the World Cup. So um, that's a good question. I don't have a great answer. Uh, I mean, maybe my long winded answer no, is an example it, right? of I don't I don't have a great answer of how how different they would be. No, I think you just nailed it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Another some other cool. You played with some other really great uh, Blanco, and I actually yeah. read somewhere along the way that you kind of served as a translator for him on the field at times. Do, um, how's he like to play with? Do, you know any wild story? I mean, he what a personality. Do you have any funny stories about playing with him? Yeah, I mean he he, um, you know he was the first. He came. Uh, before Beckham Mm -hmm. and arguably the best Mexican player of all time. Yeah. Um, And he he was a competitor. He hated to lose. 
uh, you saw him do things with the ball that you never saw. Like it was like the real first time that you saw someone that would try things as if they're just playing in the streets, Mm -hmm. which was so fun to watch Mm -hmm. partially because my, at least my game and how I saw the game and played the game had such an element of rigor and discipline to it to have someone. I know it well. Yeah. That you, that you played with that was so free flowing and so creative, you know, he's taking, you know, 60 yard long balls that are coming across the field. He turns and takes it where it it short hops and hits him on the butt. Right. That's (laughs) how he traps the ball. Right. And, and you see him, you know, his, his patent move where he squeezes the ball with both feet when got, when guys come in and he jumps with the ball Mm -hmm. out of a tight. So what he could do with the ball was incredible. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's probably some off, uh, uh, off camera, uh, stories, <laughs> yeah. uh, of him, you know, he was just a jokester, uh-huh. um, which was so awesome as you had this, uh, vicious competitor on the field and off the field, you know, we would travel and he would, uh, he would treat, uh, guy like the whole team to dinner. He, you know, when, when we're again, um, I mean, things like that, you know, and he, he took our massage therapist to, uh, 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 his name was Kurt and they became friends. Uh, and he took him to Vegas for a weekend nice. and all expense paid for. They just went and had a long weekend in Vegas. Nice. Um, so, uh, he just was a jokester. He was the guy that was pulling, t- pulling chairs out from under guys as they're seating, uh, you know hiding things uh you know he was really good at uh cracking jokes in team meetings to keep things light hiding and scaring guys in you know hotel rooms from random spaces uh i mean he was like a kid he really was like a kid off the field which was fun man that guy is so cool i love hearing that that because he was awesome and what a great i thank you for sharing those great stories um that makes me love him that much more. And he was great. He played really well. Like, I, again, maybe not prime, but like he was balling there. I mean, I thought he was still yeah. great. He was great. He was great for us. And, and you know, again, whether it was in his prime or, uh, but he was, he did not come and, you know, you know, sometimes when you get these big money players, you, you question are you coming for a paycheck? Yeah. And, and, and he was not that. Yeah. That's so uh, great. I love hearing And that. so, yeah. And as an American fan, he was a guy that you hated yeah. growing up, <laughs> yeah. right? Like you right. respected his game, but the, but the U S Mexico rivalry, but then like so many guys, when you get them in the locker room, um, it's just another dude. And so, awesome. um, yeah, he was a really good, really good guy, man. That's, that's everything and more I could have expected from a from yeah. Blanco stories, and then you you played with Freddie Youngberg a little bit as well, right? Yeah. And yeah. How was he? Um, you know, we he was he, you know he was a really really good player. He was towards the end of his career, sure. um, which was different. He had he had come you know he spent. Uh, uh, Chicago was not his first stop in MLS. He spent a little bit of time in Seattle, I believe, mm-hmm. yeah. before he came to us. Um, th- that was during a time where, uh, uh, you know, we were starting to struggle in mm-hmm. Chicago. And so infrastructure was a little bit different. Quality of players and and your roster quality was a little bit different. And so I think it was hard. It was, it was tough tougher to support a player like Freddie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Had he come during the, you know, Chris Armas, Jesse Marr, CJ Brown, Zach Thornton era, I think we would have gotten a different Mm -hmm. production from him. Uh, But again, a guy that's played uh, at the top level, um, you know, was a part of that unbelievable Arsenal team. The Invincibles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, special to share a locker room in, the, in a field with a guy like that. That's awesome. That's so cool. I mean, what a, unbelievable that you even got. It's just just crazy that I'm even talking to you that got to talk, play with these players. I mean, wow. Um, and um, you know, I um, so I want to hear. So we asked Eddie Robinson this, and I was curious if you had any other any kind of crazy ones too but back in the old days the super league games where you know you guys would play against central american teams and um eddie had some bonker stories did you have i mean you have any that you can recall that you were like whoa this is intense maybe borderline scary yeah you know um my um to preface my memory like there's certain guys that can remember every action of every game mm -hmm. that they played. My memory of the game is much more blurred than that. Um, Cause you're one so, of the, you're one so of the, dialed in. You were just, yeah, I, 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 I've seen I, it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll yeah. take that. Yeah. I don't know if that's the truth, but I'll take that. No, it is. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the distinct memories that really opened my eyes uh, was like, uh, it was in 2002. Um, you know, I, I, you know, my story is a, a, a little bit, you know, l let me just take, you know, uh, let me take like two minutes to rewind. I mean, my, I came through the club system. I played middle school soccer uh, and it was co-ed. It's one of the things that I tell, like when I speak to kids, you know, I, I always dreamt of playing at Carolina. I, I was a ball boy for Carolina when oh, I was yeah. 10 years old. Yep. So I knew those guys. That, that was where I d d dreamt of playing. Um, so it was fulfilling a dream. I mean, I coming into Chapel Hill, I, the other thing that I, I say is, you know, Grant Porter was state player of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, and we came in and, you know, we're, we're best of buddies now. Mm -hmm. He played zero professional games and I played 300. Right. Um, and uh, I mean, maybe my uh, my developmental growth changed a little bit, but some of that was just luck. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it could have been him. It, it really could have been him uh, he was uh, and not incredible. me. And, you know, he didn't get the opportunity that I did that I did. And, you know, and then when I got it, I, I ran with it. But um so uh, to fast forward, you know, I was a part of the Olympic team uh, while, you know, I'd just gotten pulled into a national team camp, an Olympic team national team camp. And, uh, and, and after that, did well. After the fall of, of 2002, um, after the fall of 2002, we uh, had the opportunity to leave sign pro contract our olympic team coach i'm going to get to your story trust me no, no, it's uh, good. Uh, uh, our olympic team coach uh glenn mooch Myernick, who has yeah. since passed away yeah. uh um said to the guys guys if you want to have a chance to make the olympic team you got to be a pro so you know signed a pro uh, was offered a twenty four thousand dollar semi-guaranteed project 40 contract which, you know, at that age, the, the, the idea of playing professional was just amazing. Drafted by the fire. But that year, so now it's 2003, not 2002. 2003, we had qualifiers for Athens. Wow. Um, and uh, we, we, so the way that it worked was there was two groups of four, top two teams in each group cross over. So one plays two, two plays one. And you have to win the semifinal in order to get to the Olympics. We win our group. The the uh, the uh, qualifiers were in Guadalajara, oh, Mexico. Wow. wow! We win our group. Uh, Mexico gets second in their group based on goal differential. So we end up playing, having to play Mexico in um, Jalisco Stadium uh, in Guadalajara. Wow. Um, and I, I'll never forget, you know, the armed soldiers and guards, you wow. know, uh, that were outside of our locker room and outside of the tunnel and coming out onto the field, um, you know, whatever it was, 45, 50,000 people 
shout, you know, this was not too long after 9-11. Mm. And so 50,000 people shouting Osama. Wow. Uh, which w- was, wow. Uh, 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 was sad, disheartening. Um, also, the first time that your eyes were really open and they're like, Oh my gosh, this, this is more than this is more than just a game yeah. in these parts of, in, in these parts of the the world. And so, you know, I um, we ended up getting rolled up for nothing in that semifinal game and not making Athens, which is a whole different thing. But that was the first. When you talk about like reflecting on times of like the first time stepping into a hostile hostile stadium. Uh, with supporters or fans that were that were pretty pretty uh pretty vicious so yeah that that would be this the story that comes out that's of like pretty hair oh this is real this is real wow that's that is intense i mean man um and then one last thing before we jump into our fun rapid fire question is again in my research of all the world of um Logan Pauls, I happened upon a video somewhere of Chris Rolfe, who, by the way, I love Chris Rolfe. He was an awesome player, and I'd love to get him on if if he's ever listening because I thought he was a great, great, great player. And I, it sounds like you guys are pretty good buds. Yeah. But he was telling this story about, and I don't want to tell it for you, but about how you broke your ribs really bad one time, so bad that you couldn't even fly home so that you guys rented a van and drove out. can you what happened can you kind of retell that story yeah we were in philadelphia um i had i got elbow or i got knee in the back on a corner kick and got a pneumothorax so a broken rib and and you know a punctured a punctured lung oh and so God. they the, the, you know the 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 doctor said you can't fly because of the altitude oh my god with with your lung and I want it to collapse. And so, um, you know, our trainer, Bo Leonard, uh, it, you know, was like, let's just, you know, maybe, maybe we can rent a car. And so, you know, I'll never free. I, you know, so, you know, Rolfie raised his hand and was like, I'm in, um, you know, two of the coaches, Frank Klopas, who's the, who's yeah. the current coach of the fire. Yeah. Mike Makovich, uh, who anyone that's been around the, the game for a long time. He's a, he's a Chicago magic legend, uh, you know, in terms of uh, he's been around Chicago for the Chicago soccer scene for a long time. So the five of us piled into a van and started the drive. And I'm, I mean, I never forget, you know, they just, they took turns driving through the night and, you know, we're, we're driving from Philadelphia to Chicago and I never forget how much pain I was in <laughs> on that drive because I was laughing so hard of the jokes and the, the banter <laughs> and, you know, the, the, you know, by the morning people are losing their mind because they're so tired and the stuff that the, the stuff that they're saying. So, yeah, that was uh, what that's, that is a memory that, that, that Rolfie brings up often in terms of what a fun time that was, but yeah, the times are a little bit different where, you know, you don't oftentimes see guys, jump in a 14 hour 12 hour car ride just to get back uh, yeah i remember him saying <laughs> that too he was like w- he was in so much pain because we kept making him laugh yeah. oh man what a story uh, that's awesome well yeah i mean all those players you played with i mean uh, you know chris Rolf, justin map all damani ralph Razov. I was, I, I was such a fan of that team and we i watched you guys all the time um well that's so great thank you for sharing this um, all right, we're going to dive into the rapid fire. Let's do That's it. cool with you. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, all right, the favorite, Messi or Ronaldo, who you got? Messi. Right on. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll, uh, so uh, I should probably have, you know, all of all of this is just opinions, right? Sure. Like, like not, and so – There's no right um, or wrong. How, how I played the game is how I see the game and how I see the game, you know, and when we get into our 11, you'll see some of – some of my kind of out of the box type of, uh, and so, yeah, just, uh, um, being a team guy, mm-hmm. I'm, I am more naturally gravitate towards those guys that are more team guys. That's right. Um, not suggesting that either, I don't know either of them. Sure. They could be the, the best team guys, but yeah, if I, if I'm, 
if I'm picking us, uh, you know, my first draft pick out of those two is coming is Messi. And that's a, you can't go wrong. Uh, yeah. me, Messi or Maradona? Who? Um, you know, I, I, my, my head wants to say Messi. My heart, I would just love. I like if if I could pick Maradona so that I could be around him and be on the field with him and see him every day, Maradona. Yeah. Because I want I, I want to know, and I don't know what it's like for Messi, but I know much more about what it's like with Messi than I would with Maradona. So, uh, yeah, um, I'm I'm going Maradona. I love it. I love that. Yes. Yeah, interestingly, Eddie had a good comment about that one, which I haven't thought hadn't thought of. He said. Messi would have never been able to survive back then. He's like, I mean, people were breaking your back in games back then. And, Ma and Maradona would, I mean, he, there's that video of him literally kicking people in the face with a, in a brawl. Like, he was tough as nails. And he would get taken down. Not that Messi doesn't, but, like, it was definitely rougher back then. Again, the head answer is probably Messi. But the heart, for me, with Maradona, it was like that was when we were 10 years old. 90 World Cup, I was like, that dude, like, yeah. I, I, deal me in. I'm going with that yeah. guy. He was like Mick Jagger. You know, he was little. I was short. He, so I love that answer. Um, yeah. Again, I hate asking this question, but I love answering asking it because we love both of these players so, so much. And you probably know both these guys, but Donovan or Dempsey? You know, I, um, I'm probably saying Dempsey. Um, nice. you know, I, 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 you know, I, I know Landon more than I know, um, uh, than I know Clint, um, Landon, Landon was the face of us soccer mm -hmm. forever. So again, if, if I'm allowed to somewhat straddle the fence and go my, you know, my head, my head probably says Landon, but what I love about Clint is he, he Landon also has a story, mm -hmm. but he from a very young age was like the prodigals, it, like yeah. just the prodigy, right? The right. prodigy. Um, Clint, you know, he came from middle of nowhere, yeah, Texas, and yeah, and you know, played at Furman, and right. and, and and so I just love his story yeah. that he he really worked his way. Mm -hmm. Landon also worked his way up, but a different pathway. So. Um, and then I think Clint is just was just a killer. I mean, so just a, just a killer. He's kind of our guy. Landon's kind of Captain America, but Clint's kind of our guy. Like he's kind of. I mean, he's from Texas, but he's kind of a southeast guy. Like I yeah. remember Sean McGinty telling me stories about how you used to hang out with him at regional camps and stuff. Like he feels like he's kind of like our guy a little bit. You yeah. know, like came yeah. from our crew and. Um, you and I, you would hear, I mean, I heard, I don't even know if this is true. I've never even, but like you would hear stories. I, I mean, I heard a story. Uh, um, so Clint, if you're watching, you could, you could confirm this, uh, that at Furman that like, there was a game that he like, that he is either he megged or he double megged a guy. Um, and just flicked the ball up to himself and caught it in his hand and just punted it as far as he could, <laughs> where he basically was like, you know, playing playing in the street. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, again, like... He's like, I don't play um, no more. I don't got to play Yeah, no that's more. right. That's yeah. right. So, um, yeah, I just love his uh, his path. Nice. Um, favorite player of all time? Paul Scholes. Oh, love that answer. The Ginger Prince. I love it. Uh and um actually and two like um real quickly like what do you, how much watch soccer are you getting to watch these days and what do you watch do you try to watch mls a lot do you watch epl do you watch and and if so like who's your team do you have a do you have a favorite team aside from the that's shotgun good. fire no, that's a good question i mean i i my i've got three young kids i got three young girls um so the the TV is on rarely. Mm -hmm. Sports is even on more rarely. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm I'm in a season where it's it's uh, I live off highlights. Sure. You know, big games. You know, when the World Cup's happening. When you know, I, I do uh, tomorrow, all two o'clock. I will 
either go somewhere or bunker down and watch that Champions League final. Sure. Um, uh, so, yes, I still love the game domestic and abroad. I still got a lot of guys that are um, that are in the game in the MLS. So I try to follow as much as I can, whether they're coaches or players or, or in management or, or GMs. Um, um, you know, my favorite team, you know, I, I've always I've always been attracted to coaches. Yeah. It's just how I've seen the game of, um, and so I've always more than the badge. I've always like I just loved Alex Ferguson, and yeah, me too. you know I love Jurgen Klopp and these yeah. like these managers of, um, you know how how they can work at the absolute top, but they are also um, you know they, they are both incredible tactical minds but also leaders Mm -hmm. now every coach is a leader by default but there's definitely people that you're like you're different in how you lead people um so yeah i'll I'll straddle a fence on that a little bit of of uh I, i i my most of where i gravitate towards to the manager that's cool that's a great answer um Who's your favorite center mid of all time? Paul Scholes. No, love it, love it. That he's up there for me. I mean, I'll, I'll give you. A, I mean, I'll give you uh, Zidane. Sure. You know, if if just if you want a, a different name. No, no, um, I, I, I love it. Um, who's the best player you ever played with or against? I played against. I played against Cristiano when like when he was with his youth uh with Portugal against Portugal um you know now again that, that's uh that's a topper. Um, yeah it's hard to argue that <laughs> I mean, that's uh that's that's unbelievable you you're 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 the top on that one love lovejoy did just say he got to play with Messi actually in a like um there was like a they happened to be in Houston and they need a couple extra bodies and Rob yeah. Lovejoy happened to be around, and Di Maria and a, a Sergio Aguero and Messi, and he was like, "I'll play." And so he got to play with them, which is pretty unbelievable. That's awesome. But yeah, um, and um, uh, all right. So uh, now's the time. What, who's your yep. perfect eleven? Any any era team combined? Yeah, here we go. Let's do it. Um, uh, Peter Schmeichel and goal. Love it. Uh, across the back. Um, Maldini, mm-hmm. um, Eddie Pope, yes, love it. Carlos Puyol and Cafu. Uh, uh, Cafu. Nice. Um, you know, I, I I I'd like to probably pull uh, Beckenbauer in there, but you know, Eddie coming from North Carolina, like I, he's I, our guy. I think yeah. I think what he did at Chapel Hill, and then I think what he did for our national team, mm-hmm. and for uh, what he did at DC United, yep. could be one of the most important players I think in our uh, in our sport in our country. Absolutely. So Top. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie's uh, Eddie's in there. I the three that. in the middle, uh, you know, Paul Skull. I Paul Skulls was just I loved him mm-hmm. as a player and how he played, and he could do everything. He could do everything. Um, so the three in the middle, probably uh, Skulls, Zidane, and George Best. Love it. Um, uh, you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to think, not just the the. You know, it, again, some of this is just how I the, the players that I watched and how I uh, saw the game, and then the three up top uh, would be Marco Van Bastian, nice. Messi, and Thierry Henry. Oh, that's such a killer lineup! I love it. So, a little bit different, uh, you no, know, in terms great. of some of the some of those. But you know, when I look back at the at the guys that I watched coming up, uh, you know, the the and and even before, I mean, there's a couple, you know, with George Best was was pre my era, but um, but some yeah, say he's love, the best of all time. Those guys. The fifth yeah. Beatle, um, yeah. the. Uh, I love the Van Basten call. That's a killer one. 
And, um, yeah. you know, it's, I, I, I'll, I'll give you another compliment. Paul Scholes, I would argue that you, if I could compare you to any player, it would probably be Paul Scholes, as a matter of fact. Huh. It, interestingly, though, back in the day, I would have said you were more of a killer striker. But watching you professionally, you definitely were kind of a Paul Scholes s figure because you still could put you could still put on that hat and put it in the back of the net with the best of them. You still had that striker mentality, but you 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 became that great great basically multifaceted all purpose center mid that still had that explosive speed and you could rip it and you, you like Scholes never made a mistake and I don't think I've ever seen you made a mistake ever. So. Um, you didn't watch enough games there. The no, I did, man. I watched, <laughs> I watched a lot. Um, well, hey, man, um, thank you so much. Like, this has been – this surpassed my wildest expectations. And um, I'm just beyond honored and flattered and appreciative that you could give me some of your time. And, um, you know, just so happy for all the success that you had. And I'm sure you don't even remember this story, but – I saw you on campus at Chapel Hill right after you guys had just won the national championship. And I remember bumping into you in between classes and I was like, so what are you going to do? And you're like, I think I'm going to go for it. And I was like, dude, that's awesome. And we were talking about it back then. It was like the league was still like, is this thing going to make it? Or, and you, and you kind of had this, like, I, I'm going to go for it. And I was like, dude, do it. It sounds awesome. I'm rooting for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, here we are 20 years later and uh, talking about you playing with Cristiano Ronaldo and, Car uh, you know, Blanco and Freddie Youngberg. And so um, it worked out and I'm so happy yeah. for you. Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate you, you saying that. You know, I mean, I, I have to um, at least say, I mean, again, it, none of these things happen in isolation or by themselves. I mean, again, I, I I describe myself as the tip of the iceberg of good. Um, no, uh, and 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 no. and I and That's I just, just was in the was in the right place at the right time. I stayed healthy for a long time. Um, I didn't cost. I didn't I, I I didn't take too much money from the fire. So I was never real. You know, I, a lot of things worked out, and there's a lot of players that don't go on to make it grant porter being one of them you know these guys that were as talented as i were um that just didn't get a chance and so yeah i mean amazing memories all the way back to where we shared the field i mean i think we were the best team to never win a thing um yeah we well, you know boy were uh, we yeah yeah, you know, uh, we never won any tournament, anything. Uh, but uh, and then, you know, the memories and the friendships from teammates at Chapel Hill. And, you know, again, uh, that's why they call it the beautiful game, right? That's right. And uh, you're being way too humble because if anyone deserved it, it was you. And, um, you know, I, uh, you, I you are right, though. There were some some people at their peak like Keith Rice and Craig Falta yeah. at their peak and Wisdo almost were unmatchable, you know, right. but the injuries and, you know, like poor yep. was, it, it's tough. But I, I got to say, if any, I don't think I ever met anybody that worked harder than you. And, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Adam Colburn and some of these other incredible players I played with. I got to give a shout out to Buddy Forward, too, for our team. I know you love that one. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I don't know if you see him on Instagram. He's turned into quite the New York fashionista. By the way, it's worth a okay. look. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not on Inst I'm not on social, so I'm not I'll, on. So I'll, I'll send you some screenshots and it'll. Okay. And buddy, okay. I'm doing that for you, buddy. Um, all right, man. Thank you so yeah. much. It's been an honor, a pleasure. Thank you for all Likewise. your time. Best to you and your family. And Thank you. uh, Likewise. Tell your friends. Thanks for having me. See if we can get Rolfi on here. Maybe. Maybe Blanco, I don't know, do some favors. So, Maybe Jesse good. Marsh. Uh, we'll see. All right. Hey, I'll buddy. see what I can do. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, you have a great one, man. I'll be in touch. You too. All right. Thanks, Take buddy. care. All right.